Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Lucas Oil and TireRack.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 268, and I should say the last podcast of 2021. And because of that, we have a big group that is participating today. Brian Robinson, Jessica Ray, Alex Kellum, and Greg Carlos. We're actually going to start with you. Why don't you bring us, before we talk about anything that's new on our lot, well, this is new, actually. It's our newest long-term and a midsize SUV we were very impressed with when we uh, did our initial road test, the all-new Nissan Pathfinder. So what do we know so far after living with it? Uh, yeah, as you said, John, this is an all-new Pathfinder. And uh, before I get into <clears throat> what we've learned so far, and it's actually been a fairly short amount of time. I mean, we literally took delivery of this like two weeks ago. Um, so we're uh, just kind of getting our uh, seats worn in, as it were. Um, it, uh, if you think about the last generation of the Pathfinder, that's when they went really crossovery. So like, and I know that's not a word crossovery, but to me, I'm going to make that a word. Uh, it got very, uh, jelly bean, like, uh, where, it, um, it kind of took on the shape of a car, uh, but just like a lifted car. Um, and now we're going back to more of the, the traditional, uh, Pathfinder style. If you can remember the mid two thousands of that, like boxy looking Pathfinder, uh, this is like a modern take on it, so it's, it sits more upright, uh, but it has a slightly more rounded edges. Uh, it has the Nissan grill, which we see on uh, everything now. I mean, every manufacturer likes to make a grill and then just put it on everything because it's all about brand awareness and making sure everybody knows uh, what you're driving. <clears throat> so the one we have is the the platinum trim, which is the highest trim you can get in a Pathfinder um, and it's it's really well equipped. Um, it has a chestnut, like a, a, a nice rich brown leather interior, uh, quilted seats, some leather on the dash, uh, nine inch touchscreen, fully digital gauge cluster. And that's kind of another big difference between this generation and the previous one. Uh, when, the, when the previous generation came out, in terms of tech, it already felt old. Um, <clears throat> This one feels like a, a, an SUV of the times, um, wireless charging in our model, um, um, Apple CarPlay, like I said, the big, the big touchscreen and everything. Um, but we're probably, what I'm going to get a lot of use out of and probably a few other members is the second row captain's chairs. Uh, they fold forward, uh, easy access to the third row. This does have a third row. It's not a big one. Um, you can put people back there if you'd like to, but uh, only if you're really upset at them. Uh, if they're if they're adults, uh, kids will be fine. Um, but uh, you'll usually keep those. Uh, we'll, we will usually keep those folded um, and probably be loading uh, some building materials in there, as we mentioned in our road test. And actually, with all the second and third row folded, you can actually fit four foot wide materials in the back, which is uh, pretty useful for people who you know are maybe down a pickup or or uh, don't even own a pickup. So um, that's pretty cool uh 6, pounds of towing ours does have a tow hitch on it so you can carry you can tow a nice size camper um heated front seat heated and cooled front seats heated second row seats another big deal uh for families and uh all told ours is uh, fifty one thousand dollars uh which is not cheap but i think uh in line with the rest of nissan's lineup um i think there's a lot of bang for your buck there and it's also very much competitive with just about everything else it goes up against. Actually, top of the line in 51,000, it's actually a little bit of a bargain, even compared to uh, the Hyundai Palisade and Telluride, uh, which are hot. Do you think it's um, a viable alternative to the one, the benchmark, which is the Highlander? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I couldn't say that in the previous generation, but uh, having spent... Um, probably more time than anybody on staff in this uh, long term. Uh, I'm thoroughly impressed. It's, it's comfortable. The um, it's just, it's big. It, it, to me, I like an SUV to feel like an SUV, which, which this does. And I mean, it has every piece of tech that I want wireless charging, wireless Apple CarPlay. Um, again, like I said, the heated seats and everything, the big deal is the switch. Um, from a CVT, which basically every 
car person in history hates a CVT. Uh, <laughs> now they have a, a nine speed automatic geared, an actual geared transmission. And that makes a huge difference under acceleration um, because not only does it sound better, it just feels more natural. And it's a stout engine, three, uh, 284 horsepower, 3.5 liter V6. That's a common engine with, with Nissan. And uh, it, it feels stout when you get on it. Anybody else had any experience with it? I've done, I've had very little so far of the- uh, I haven't driven the, uh, this one, but I spent a great amount of time in our test one. Uh, the CV, I was gonna hit on the CVT elimination as well. That's obviously the biggest thing for me. Um, I did a lot of towing. We had the last gen long-term and I did some towing with that. And that, you know, despite the numbers they put out, that CVT just does not uh, want to tow. Uh, it was not a great experience. Uh, I guess the biggest issue I have with this one, it certainly looks more uh, rugged and much more pathfindery, uh, at, uh, also creating words like Greg. Uh, it's still the same crossover chassis, Ultima chassis underneath of the last gen. So I think now it kind of over promises, um, you know, before you looked at that pathfinder and you're like, yeah, I'm not taking that thing off road. Uh, this one, it looks like, wow, you know, I could conquer the world in this thing, but it's really the, everything the same uh, underneath. So maybe it over promises a little, but it certainly looks cooler. Any comments? Yeah. Oh, man. Go ahead. I was just going to say anecdotally, um, I was seeing mid 20s um, with a fair amount of highway driving and uh, that's fuel economy. I think it's rated at 23 MPG combined EPA rating. Um, and like I said, I'm looking at the trip computer. So take that for what it's worth, uh, but roughly 25 miles per gallon. That's very competitive. Alex or Jessica, any thoughts before we move on? Yeah, I mean, I... I... Uh, have to agree that I really like the the new nine speed automatic. I spent time in, in the Pathfinder and also in the Infinity QX60, um, and in both applications, uh, uh, it was it was a much improved driving experience for both. Alex, I know you're new to the staff, but have you actually even uh, seen the uh, new Pathfinder? Yeah, I, I I did see it out there. I have not driven it yet, but um... Do you like what you no, see? That, so far, what I can tell you from the outside, yeah, I really like the way it looks. And just hearing no CVT, that, that sounds good to me. I got a question for uh, Brian Robinson. Okay, can you describe the difference in trying to tow with something, you know, I'm, we're not talking huge trailers here, but trying to tow with a CVT versus a geared transmission. What does it actually feel like or so, sound like? Yeah, it feels so CVT in general feels like your transmission is basically just a rubber band in there and uh, it gets larger and smaller. Um, depends it's about on, right. If uh, depending on what kind of power you're asking for, much like a, a, a bicycle chain on a 10 speed, you change the size of it and it changes the gearing. So um, it just never, you know, when you're going up a hill or going down a hill and you need some engine braking. Uh, you need a gear and you need a vehicle to stay in that gear. And in some of the tow modes with the CVTs kind of do that. They lock you into a range, but just there's a constant slip slidey feel that just is not confidence inspiring uh, when towing a trailer, certainly uh, uphill. It's, it's, uh, it's always that, uh, or at least for me, when it's like all season tires where it's trying to be a little bit of everything the CVT is that for like a transmission where it's like, it's going to be fuel efficient. It's going to be performance or like, it's always trying to put you in the right gear instead of like, just saying like, here's what I need it for. Let's just keep it right there. And the CVT yeah. is always trying to like tinker with it. It's um, always trying to outthink you. In a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got two new vehicles we're going to talk about today, and both of them are all, all electric, and they are at two different ends of the price spectrum for uh, new EVs. First one we're going to talk about, we're going to save the second one towards uh, the end of the show, and uh, Jessica's had most time with that one, but Alex, you've come back from the first extensive time that anyone's had in our staff with the 2022 Hyundai Ioniq 5. I've driven it briefly, but you drove it for 
hours on end. Kind of give us an idea of where it is, where it fits in the market and the basics and uh, what'd you think of it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so as alluded to, I was flown out to San Diego to drive the new Ionic 5 and um, it was a rainy day. Never rains in SoCal, but apparently it does when I'm there. Uh, but that actually worked in our favor. So we were paired with the limited all wheel drive uh, versions of the Ionic 5. So that has the dual motor setup. Um, all in all, uh, at the time when they gave the presentation, like we didn't know the pricing yet and all of that. So we were really kind of going into these vehicles without having a good idea of where exactly they were going to be. Ended up pricing it around where we thought, you know, we're talking starting at 40,000 and going up. Uh, and really going into it with the presentation, they, they, they kind of introduced it as we wanted to tackle the biggest issue that's facing prospective EV buyers, which is range anxiety, and then kind of going forward with that, uh, like a slow charging time and, and things like that. Uh, and then actually having time to drive the Ionic 5, uh, I can definitely see where they were going uh, with that. Again, I had the all-wheel drive version of it dual motor setup. We're talking about, I think it's 260 miles worth of range. Um, the standard, which is all wheel drive, or I'm sorry, rear wheel drive, that one is 300 miles worth of range. And then there's a standard range model, which is much lower. That's the $40,000 one. Uh, it has about 230 miles worth of range. And then you can bump up to the SE, which is the rear wheel drive or is available as a rear wheel drive starts at 45. So in regards to pricing for an electric SUV, I, I think it's uh, at a very good position. They weren't trying to draw too many comparisons to the Mach-E, but it's almost hard not to make comparisons to the Mach-E with regards to the size, with regards to the interior, and then of course, with regards to range and power and everything like that. So I'm, I want to stop you right there. So, okay, this is the modern a modern definition of an SUV. Yes. That also puts it uh, up against uh, the uh, Volkswagen ID4, although you didn't mention that as a direct competitor. Do you think this is a little bigger, a little more, more stylish? I mean, the ID4 looks pretty much like a, a, a boxy Volkswagen. Well, how yeah. would you describe it? Um, so... For the Ionic 5, uh, definitely with regards to style, if I can start there, uh, yeah. they really hinted at a, a very uh, future modern type design. And I really see that, uh, especially in the front with the, uh, they, they called it a pixel inspired design. You can absolutely see that from the daytime running lights and the headlights in the, in the front. You have these two kind of like rectangular cubes on either end. And then on the mirrors, you have this like thin strip of, of, of cubes that run along for your turn signals. And then in the rear of the whole taillight, uh, it, it, it just envelops the rear. Um, and it's just a bunch of individual little, little pixels that come together and create the turn signals and brake lights and all of that. Uh, and then you have a lot of sharp angles. The rear has a 45 degree uh, C pillar, not Coupish. I don't want to describe this as something uh, like an SUV coupe. It, it is very much a traditional like SUV, as you mentioned. Um, in terms of size, I think uh, off the top of my head, it felt a little roomier than the ID4, uh, and they they really they really kind of uh, touted that as having a flexible and optimized interior. Um, certainly, I believe has a longer wheelbase as well. They have a new platform for it, the eGMP which they're gonna kind of use to spearhead all of their uh, electric vehicles, uh, at least certainly in, in the uh, US market and then I believe international as well. So it definitely felt, a, well, it, I think it is a little bit bigger but it didn't feel too much bigger. It, it, it's not like it was a, a lumbering SUV or anything, uh, especially again, all wheel drive, felt very nimble. Um, and yeah, I would say the design futuristic. The, the one thing with that that I kind of commented on was uh, the rear taillights uh, to me, and maybe I'm off in saying this, but when I look at them, like when I see the front, I see, okay, this is a modern design. It's a futuristic design. I get that. The wheels, the sharp lines on, on the sides that, that kind of go along the bottom, the side skirts, it's all there. And then I look at the rear and it almost made me think this is a design that maybe five years ago that we thought was going to be futuristic with all the individual little pixels. It felt a little much, I, admittedly, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. I like it a lot. 
I'd go back even further than five years. I see. Yeah. I look at this car, and I and with the pixels, I think everything like eight bit, eight bit video games, yeah. where yeah. everything yeah. because this is this is a car that has like such '80s styling ingrained in it with the super sharp angles, and like you said, the the pixelation there. I mean, I really dig it. I think this thing looks oh yeah maybe better than any EV, uh, and that's just my taste. I think something that we also glance over is that this is standard rear wheel drive, not front wheel drive, a Hyundai, a rear wheel drive. So, I mean, we're talking about like performance aspects here. If you're, if, if, if that's yeah. any part of your uh, buying decision performance, I mean, that that's pretty cool. And I think that kind of get lost because most people want all wheel drive or just assume a Hyundai is going to be a front wheel drive, even if it is electric. I mean, we're, we're talking about a rear wheel drive uh essentially raised hatchback back to the whole like what is an suv thing that's essentially that's what this is is a raised raised hatchback that's you know it's interesting that you bring that up greg because um (laughs) if you look at a lot of the comparables in this class no one knows how to classify them they uh if you look at like um if you want to go look at the range on fueleconomy.gov like even they don't know how to how to classify them they're all considered different um utilities uh suvs crossovers whatever you want to call them even though they're if you look at like dimensions uh inside and outside they're kind of this similar but like not at the same time so nobody actually really knows what to classify a lot of these new smaller evs as yeah and we actually got into that discussion when we were doing our driver's choice award selections you know people people decide they want an ev and then they go figure out which one best fits what they're looking for they don't necessarily i'm going to go get a suv oh i can get an electric one now so yeah it's interesting to see going forward how all those uh you know segments are going to merge into one another uh but just ditto on the looks uh, it looks amazing uh to me almost as a cyber truck uh, kind of vibe to it ah, interesting um but uh yeah Cool. Good job, Hande. Yeah, not yeah. to get too deep into this, but it's almost like we're kind of, you know, making social commentary here with uh, car makers, like not really conforming to traditional segments anymore. They're like, who even cares what we're calling? It? I mean, yeah, technically, I guess we have to call it something, but like, do you like it? Great. Let's, I mean, then buy it. Like who cares if it's an SUV? Who who cares if it's a hatchback? I mean, it's, it is what it is. I don't think we need to put a label on it. Think about what a major change that is. What 10 years ago, you couldn't give away a hatchback in this country. And now you've basically taken station wagon slash hatchback, raised them a little, and it's now the preferred body style. And that we thought would never happen in this country because it hadn't happened for a long time when everybody else in the world was pushing it. But that's interesting. The comment that several of you made about the electric car revolution sort of like amalgamating this, this concentration of all vehicles and you know, all of the EV vehicles into one lump. I know it's not quite true that way, but it, it is kind of interesting that the differentiation between a sedan, hatchback, um, SUV is uh, even more blurred than it was getting before. Thank you, Alex, for a very good report. Before we end, let, I, we didn't really talk about the interior. Uh, the interior yeah. is very modern. Uh, I mean, lots of a big screen. And uh, I, like I said, I spent a limited time in it. You spent hours in it. I thought it was yet another, um, shall we say, take on what probably Tesla started with minimalistic, but big screen. However, there's plenty of manual controls. Uh, Talk to uh, about when you first got in and after about four or five hours, was it easy enough to, to figure out everything? Did you feel like you were having to use the screen for too many functions? Uh, are there a number of sure, sure. controls, whatever? Yeah, so uh, getting inside of it, 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 it's kind of funny. When I first got in, I was very impressed. I mean, I'm impressed with the whole car, uh, everything about it, I, I really like. Um, and yes, that pixel uh, inspired design you know, that those motifs are carried on inside. You get the little etchings everywhere and stuff. Um, but in terms of functionality, um, 
So it does have two screens, two very large screens. I think they're 12.3 inches. One is for the instrument panel. One is for your infotainment. The instrument panel is very straightforward. It shows you everything you need to, to see. And then, of course, you have the, the usual stocks for like your windshield wipers and everything like that. All of that is super easy to figure out. Uh, you have two um, paddle shifter-esque uh, paddles on the steering column that adjust your regenerative braking. Uh, and it also allows you to set the one pedal drive. Um, that's all very intuitive, very easy to use. Changing your drive modes, again, very simple on the fly. Uh, the only area where I had a little bit of difficulty was with the infotainment. And it's not to say Hyundai's in-house infotainment is bad. Um, it's not. And with Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, if you really don't like it, you can always just use that. But um, I was using it uh, probably about 80% of the time. I plugged in my phone to, to try it, but for the most part, I was using it. Some of the button presses on the screen, the, the touch screen, uh, maybe skipped a beat, you know, half a second, if that. But of course, when you're using technology, we're spoiled these days. And, you know, skipping a beat or a half a second can feel like an eternity. Um, some of the navigation system, while the navigation system was good getting around San Diego, it wasn't um, it wasn't quite at the same like usability as as if I can compare it like Android Auto using Google Maps. That feels very intuitive, very easy to use. Um, this one felt like it needed some time to get adjusted to it. Uh, that all translates over to the augmented reality, which again we were paired with the limited model, so we had that there. Um, there were a few times where I felt like the navigation was almost a little behind, like it felt like I was coming up on a turn and it wasn't updating as fast as I felt like it should be. Um, that was probably the only major gripe I had with the navigation system aside from like actually having to get accustomed to it. Once I did, it felt easy to use and I didn't really have too many issues. I'm sure whatever... Uh... Hyundai has a good reputation for their in-dash uh, infotainment systems. I'm sure that's probably going to get worked out. Uh, interesting. Augmented reality. Well, it's making yes. it cars too, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it was really interesting to have. It, it, the main thing was the navigation, the speed and the speed limit. But then it could also show like if you were using the radar cruise control and things like that, the, the regenerative braking, one pedal drive, that all shows up there. And I didn't think I was going to use it a lot, but I used it a ton. It was really handy. A great feature if i could just add that not i mean i haven't used it in this car but I, on any car the, the paddle regenerative braking control is excellent feature for an ev or even a plug-in yeah it's the way to go so yeah. that's right from fingertips thanks everybody before we do our third vehicle um we're, and put jessica in the uh the bullseye for the comments uh, let's uh, do a couple of other things that we usually do on our podcast and uh, we are at the end of the year, so our lightning round question kind of um, takes that in, takes the holiday season into consideration. So let's have a little bit of fun. Um, our last lightning round of 2021. So based on your current desires, need in your household, what new vehicle would you like to receive as a gift this year? And, and to be honest, uh, you've all been very good, but uh, we don't have a lot of money. And so let's limit our MSRP to uh, around close to $50,000. Um, Jessica, why don't we start with you? If you had to, to, if you won the lottery or whatever, and you really wanted something, what would you go out and buy? Or would you? I mean, I've thought about this a lot. Um, of course, if price was no object, there's some cars that automatically came to mind but as we have a price uh limit i honestly was thinking about it and i almost hate to say it but i'd probably buy a new wrangler i'd I probably knew. upgrade I so, knew you oh my god i know i know it's awful the best thing about it is you could buy it and then sell it like three months later for 20 percent more <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, that's the that's the practical part of it because overall just not a practical purchase i mean it's not a very practical vehicle for me at this point right now my my 2008 but you know i would i would 
splurge a little bit you know I, I'd still get a two-door but I'd probably um I can't you can't get a Sahara in a two-door anymore so I'd probably get a Rubicon um well, now you know like pushing 50 now you might not that's what I'm saying I'm getting thing. close <laughs> well all right listen in a non-COVID world you know where we don't have like you know markups of five to ten thousand dollars on cars right now but um but yeah that that would be my choice I I could have nailed that one with <laughs> easily brian robinson what would you like to find under your tree or in, in your uh, well being the two-wheeling guy i'm supposed to pick a motorcycle so uh not necessarily uh, but that's yeah. good. well i'm about you know you talk about where we are in our life stage i'm about ready to be an empty nester so uh me and the wife are ready to get back on the road i would uh I would definitely opt for that BMW R18 Transcontinental that we had in the summer, uh, which, if you don't know, is essentially BMW trying to build a better Harley Davidson touring bike. I wouldn't say they were 100% successful in that, but they did create something uh, really cool, uh, really unique, uh, really big and powerful that just makes me want to uh, ride all across the country on it. Where do you think you'd go first? Oh, I just point it west and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex, what would you like to uh, find under your, your tree or <sighs> driveway this uh, year? This, yeah, this was also tough for me. Um, if I could go a little over 50,000, it would definitely be one of the new uh, Mustang Mach 1s probably also an obvious pick for me being a mustang guy you already I, own a mustang no nope, that's can't do it that's, uh, <laughs> man, i just i love them so much for jay ray yeah. But, yeah i mean jessica you guys she, are not having any fun like you, okay, i made this I, question I, thinking it was gonna be I, a fun question and now I everybody's did, just buying the same car they already have i, I got I, I got some other ones uh, up my sleeve um i was gonna pick a bronco but i don't even know if santa could get me one of those this year so <laughs> um i i if i couldn't do a bronco i do have some i have room in my life for something more practical driving into the city more recently i would either do one of the new civic hatchbacks uh like a sport touring i would consider the corolla apex edition because i just think they're neat or if pra i didn't have to get too practical kia stinger i've always liked them so oh, oh well. you know, i've been looking at used ones Really? Oh, yeah, they're nice. I, can't I, I it love still. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but what a what a terrific automobile it still is and probably won't be around much longer. So yeah. It's like, Greg, this was a question was your idea. <laughs> what what was gonna be your answer? What is well, your answer? I was hoping you'd put me right after Robinson because we could not <laughs> be on further ends of the spectrum. I'm about as far from being an empty nester as you can be because I have a, uh, a two-year-old and a soon-to-be six-month-old. So I'm just going to go Kia Carnival, and I'm not going to have to explain wow. myself uh, because that's what my wife wants. Uh, we've driven one. We're supposed to get one for a long term, hopefully. Um, practicality is what I'm all about. I love minivans, even though Kia would hate for me to call this a minivan, but let's be honest, it's a minivan. It's a minivan. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, and it's actually a really, really good van. So that's what I'm going for. It's a great looking vehicle too. Um, I've been toying around with the idea of buying an EV so I could live with one day after day, week after week for a long time. And I almost bought a, a Mach-E, but it ran into delivery situations. Since then, I've uh, looked at the market again. And while I'd love to have a Mach-E, the one I want kind of past our price barrier i'm very i was very impressed the first time uh, i drove the volkswagen id4 and that was just the two-wheel drive then we had in the all-wheel drive version i like the fact that eventually all of the id4s are going to be built here they're not yet so if i was going to find something right now and i didn't have to keep it forever but i wanted to basically drive it for a couple of years and really see what the EV experience is all about within that price range. I do the uh, uh, probably towards the base end of it, an ID4 uh, all wheel drive. And I know it's not sexy or anything else, uh, but it's a it's an experience that people in our business are need to do. And it's why when we get an electric vehicle into work, uh, everybody basically can't wait to go out and, and give it a try and see how it 
fits within the realm. So an ID4 for me. Anyway. You know, I probably would have <laughs> chosen that same thing, John, if I had a place to charge an electric car. Too late, J. Ray. You can't change. <laughs> but yeah, so, and I do. I, I set. I had my garage set up uh, several years ago so I could with a separate circuit. So, and I think that is a critical factor. Do you have yeah. a house? Do you have a place you can park it off the street? And that's going to be, I think, a big roadblock towards adoption. And don't just think you can trickle charge these EVs with 200 and 300 miles of range. It takes forever for them right. to charge. I mean, it'll help in a pinch. Like if you really need just a couple miles to get you to a fast charger or somewhere with a level two, I mean, it, it'll work, trust me, but uh, it just takes a long time. Plus my understanding, and I think this is right, uh, that when you see the 120 house current estimates for how long it will take it, uh, something to charge, that's on a 20 amp circuit. And most homes only have 15 amps, uh, say in your, near the, your garage or your carport. So that elongates that even further. I, I forgot what it was. We had something not too long ago that I did just plug into to 120 house current. And I was just stupefied how little it had added to the battery after. Yeah, a, yeah the bigger the batteries are getting and the more high speed charging capable they are, I think they're sacrificing on the low end. I mean, they take forever to charge. Uh, it's not even really feasible on uh, no. one, 120 anymore. You got to have the, uh, which anyone that buys an EV would. So it's more an issue for people like us who uh, haven't really upgraded to that. Yeah. No kidding. Well, thank you all. I hope you all get your wish. If we could make it come true, we'd say, there you go. Uh, we did get an interesting viewer question from Rich. And with everybody, I mean, we've had record people are on the roads for the holidays. And I don't know about you folks, when I go out now on any kind of trip, I take some kind of a portable air compressor along because I've had so many flat tires in the last couple of years. So this has to do with a flat tire. He said, Rich says, I recently had a flat tire from a nail. The shop asked if I wanted the tire plugged or patched from the inside. So plugged from the outside or patched from the inside. What is the best way to repair a nail hole in a tire? We're talking about something that goes through the tread and not through the sidewall. What do you think? Well, first of all, I'm shocked that the shop even offered because most times I go, they're like, oh, it's too close to the sidewall. And I'm like, yeah. it's nowhere close to the sidewall. And they, they all want to cover themselves. So, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's more well, times than not, you you're going to, yeah, more <laughs> times than not, they're going to want to sell you a new tire. So I'll let somebody else answer the rest of the question. <laughs> Yeah, if you're looking for best, you would do both. That's sort of the belt and suspenders uh, technique. Um, but I, I've I've plugged a lot of tires over the years. Uh, I've never had a problem. Um, but I think you want to get a patch on the inside if you want to do it the uh, best way possible. Anybody else? Yeah, um, I just plugged a, I plugged one of my tires the other week, actually. Um, I've never really had issues with plugs. And to attest to what Greg was just saying, I've taken a, a wheel up to a shop and, and they would not patch it. They just said, nope, it's too close to the sidewall. We're not going to do that. I would say that if you're at a shop and you can get it patched and they're fine with that, uh, yeah, sure, go with the patch. But in a pinch, I mean, I've used plugs and I've never had issues. Jessica, any tire issues? I have to knock on wood here because I have not had um, any tire issues, not to say I've never had issues with a car, but I have never had a flat tire. Well, Rich, I will tell you that Pat Goss uh, happens to think a great deal about patching a tire, and that probably is the ultimate way to do it well and permanently. However, like everybody else that's had the issues, I've plugged a lot of tires. When you're out on the road, you need to get back on the road as fast as possible. Uh, I think a plug will get you home, but when you get home, you should probably then turn around and have it uh, patched properly. So both, I think, have their place in the world of unexpected uh, tire problems. And you didn't ask, but please never use the fix a flat cans. That's oh. just a disaster. You know, what bothers me about some of the new vehicles and even that Mach-E I talked about has, they come with these tire inflators instead of a uh, spare tire, and they yep. have that kind of gunk inside of them to spray in the tire. 
my Mustang's like that. Yep. It just makes a mess after when you go to get it repaired properly. It's it's just think about emptying a couple of bottles of uh, of glue inside your tire. But yeah, whenever you use that, you're basically committing to them buying a new tire at that point. Thanks very much, Rich, for your comment. And now, Jessica, drum roll if we have it. We are turning to you for the last new vehicle we're going to talk about, an all-electric vehicle that has been teased endlessly. It's finally here, and you have had the unique version, uh, chance to drive a version of it. We're talking about the 2022 Mercedes EQS. What is EQ and what is the EQS? Yeah, so EQ is uh, Mercedes um, electric line. That is what they're calling all of their EVs. And the EQS is the first um, all electric car that Mercedes is launching here in the US. Um, and it is a, comparable to their S class sedan. So imagine this is really an all electric S class. Does it look like an S class? Mm, not so much because it's an EV. So they really went hard on the aerodynamics. So it is very, very curved. There's uh, really, it's not angular at all. It's just a lot of curves. It's everything the Ionic 5 is not. Right. <laughs> That's a it's, great way to put it. It's a coupe-like shape, right? Yes. I four mean, four-door coupe-like shape. I don't necessarily want to use the word coupe, but I will say that that if you looked at um, like like if Greg sat in the in the rear seats of the EQS compared to the S class, it will be it will be much lower in the EQS because it is more curved. I don't know that I would call it a coupe. People hate when we use that word on things that aren't actually coupes, so I use it sparingly. Um, but so. There are two versions of it here in the U.S., specifically the, 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 the EQS, there's the 450 plus, and then there's the 580 formatic. The 450 plus is a single motor um, that has about 329 horsepower, um, whereas the uh, 580, yes, 580 formatic, um, that has the dual motor setup, can get you 516 horsepower, and they're saying that that's got a 4.1 second zero to 60 um, and it can get a top speed of 130 miles per hour um, with about 350 miles of range. So it's got a really significantly sized battery under that. Um, and I drove the AMG EQS. So it's a bit sportier than the typical EQS um, and so from what I imagine, you know, sitting in the AMG EQS with AMG seats, um, the standard EQS much more luxurious um, when you think about like comfortability, but like there's a 55 inch hyper screen for, that literally goes from the left side of the dash to the right side of the dash. That means you have the a digital gauge cluster. You have this really huge infotainment area and then the passenger also has their own screen. So it's, it's really, really fantastic when you actually are able to like sit in there, see it, have the ambient lighting around you. Um, it's is got every screen, your terminology no. or is it Mercedes? Nope. That's what I thought. That is, yes, that is. <laughs> that sounds official. like marketing. Which is surprising because usually they like to put Tronic after everything. I thought it would right. be screen Tronic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, it is not. Um, yeah, it's, it's 55 inches of hyperscreen. And I mean, I, I it's was- It's funny I, every time you say it. I don't know why. Super screen. That was like Star Trek. Star Trek, you press the button and away you go, right? Kind of feels like that a little bit in there. I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Star Trek because one of the big things specifically with the AMG is of course they're, they're you know, we think, uh, of their engines, right? These like really loud, powerful engines. And so you're like, well, what is this going to sound like? So there's an AMG specific sound. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for these high performance EVs to have some sort of like sound boosting on them. Um, but this one actually sounds like a spaceship. Uh -huh. 
it like it inside wise it sounds like it's kind of alien it's very it'd be, interesting it'd be funny if uh one of the amg engine builders that puts their name on the engine was just like making engine sounds and that's what you got <laughs> <laughs> and, and like and that's leads me to another question is like are there like Pla amg plaques on like the motor or like you know, not that you would ever see them but like traditionally in an amg you get that signed plaque on the engine i mean i don't know 100 percent if there's a signed plaque but i imagine there's something on there because they did see say that these were specific amg motors um they were high performance motors so it, with the amg eqs of course it's got a dual motor setup um, with their like dynamic plus package, which is standard here in the U S you get, you get a maximum of 761 horsepower. Um, everything like suspension components are all AMG, uh, brakes are AMG. Um, uh, the, the, and one of the biggest things of course is the cooling system for this EQS. They adapted it and they improved it in order for the motors to function in a way that could get you 761 horsepower. Um, so it's, uh, of course it has like typical AMG design, like in the, in the front, the grill is like the, the AMG grill. Um, it has a little bit of a, it has a larger rear spoiler. Um, you have 21 or 22 inch wheels. Uh, this, this EQS, the AMG EQS, can go 277 miles, um, and it also can go zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds with a 155 mile per hour top speed. Of course, that is governed, but I don't know that in a vehicle that large, I would want to go much faster than that, truthfully. Um, That's the best vehicles to go that fast? Yeah, I was going to say, I you'd know, be surprised. <laughs> but, no, uh, it's but true. I, I, I have two uh, two comments. One is in relation to the S class sedan, which we just had in and tested. That's traditionally the brand flagship, and it was somewhat impressive. But then you see the interior of this car, and you're like, "Wow, this is really pushing the brand forward." Whereas the S class now, maybe that's kind of just hanging around for the more traditional buyers. Uh, second, that's a nice way thing, to put it. Um, <laughs> You, you meant old people? Is that what you meant? <laughs> um, I did not mean that at all. But second, I'm looking at one right now, a white one. And from the profile, it's like, why are the body gaps so huge? I'm like, the Ford Maverick has tighter uh, body, body gaps. I'm not sure it's... On the it's EQS, so is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The, I got to look this up. Uh, yeah. Really? Just, um, it's like, it what didn't look, look at like... My Oh, yeah. I, got, I didn't notice that so much. That Jessica, doesn't sound I, very aerodynamic. A very yeah. basic question. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were either in a flagship? Obviously, I think you probably did as far as the interior. But when you drove it, did you feel like you were driving an AMG branded or sub-branded vehicle? Did it, did it do anything for you? Did, was it emotional at all? Um, I mean... So obviously it definitely felt like I was in the flagship. I've spent a lot of time in the new S class. So to me, um, it really felt, uh, it, it very much felt like an S class should, of course, in like the more comfort mode. Um, but of course it's, it's very sport tuned. I mean, you can, it was hard because I, I had just driven a very different AMG the day before. Um, and I don't think that was a detriment to my opinion on this AMG EQS, um, but it was a very traditional AMG that I, I can't talk about for like another month. So I'm not even going to mention what car it was, um, but um, the EQS absolutely felt sport tuned. When you put it in those maximum sport modes, absolutely. It's felt sport tuned. Didn't necessarily feel like a true proper AMG. I don't think so, but I don't necessarily think that everything is going to translate 100% over. Well, that's, not, you, that's just not going to happen. You alluded to it earlier. I mean, a lot of what makes an AMG an AMG is that sound. It's a very distinct right. AMG sound, and you're just not going to get that in an electric car. Yeah, 
and and the, even the even the sound that they they've uh, managed to create um i mean when you know you you push down on the throttle and you get up and go like it it does add to the experience because it was so funny my driving partner and i like he would he would like floor it and then we would be going fast and then he would just turn off the sound because you can just turn it off if you don't want it even if you're in sport mode and then you just sit in silence and it like we couldn't help but laugh like it was just so funny to go from this like really intense moment where like the sound is really increasing your experience and then just it's gone <laughs> it was it was almost like laughable seems like spaceship spaceship is a good way to uh, describe it what i was yeah. getting at asking this question mm -hmm. and i think this is actually our problem as car testers is most of these evs are fast most of them are have yeah somewhat similar range we keep seeing you know one's got a little bit better than the other and when you really get down to it what's going to differentiate them for buyers one to the other and obviously for most of our discussions it's probably going to be the interior but if you've got a performance brand and we've talked about this with the uh, uh the tycon at porsche you you know what are they doing to keep that essence of the brand into these new electric vehicles. So uh, I'm actually very encouraged that you found there were so many things in this vehicle that meant AMG to you or said AMG to you. That's that's a good thing. So Yeah, and one, one interesting thing that I wanna mention before we, we move off of this is that, um, you know, um, and, and this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's a neutral thing. And I think it's something that car manufacturers are also trying to figure out. But if you have the EQS on the highest uh, regen braking setting, which there's only two regen braking settings. So if you're really going for the one pedal drive, the brake pedal actually moves while like if you take your foot off That's new. the throttle, yeah. the brake pedal will move for you. And I, I really wasn't able to test it out like as much as I wish I was able to. Um, because, and it's one of those things where it's like, it's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad. It's just a thing. Did they um, say why? Like, what's the point? I don't, there's no, there's no why. It just is like it. That's just how it happened. <laughs> I mean, doesn't I sound can, very German. I can <laughs> see. I mean, the, the thing is, it was more of a thing we, we noticed when we were driving rather than was mentioned in any presentation that they gave. It was like just the experience of driving. Um, but I can sort of see its application and usage. Like if you wanted to stop short, I don't know if this happens to anybody else, but sometimes when I'm driving an electric car with one pedal drive and I'm really not ever touching the brake, my brain has a lot of issues trying to remember which pedal my foot is on sometimes. Um, just because I don't drive an electric car all the time. And so I think maybe that go? could be, <laughs> that could be helpful. Um, that like, if the brake is moving for you and you need to stop short and slam on the brake, that like you're not, your foot isn't running into the brake. I would need to do some more testing with this, but um, that was just something that was really interesting I noticed. Well, that's, that is new. I've never heard of that before because all most brake pedals now are, I'm assuming this one is, they're, they're, they're not really connected to the braking system except by wires. Uh, so. Yeah, so it must be simulated in some way. So once we get it in for testing, you guys can certainly have an opinion on it then. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, all of you out there. Uh, today, we were very fortunate to have our writing two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson, our digital producer, Jessica Ray, our writer, Alex Kellum, and our over-the-edge reporter and podcast producer, Greg Carlos, with us for our last podcast of the season. We've got one more matter that we're going to ask everyone if they want to tackle before we wrap this up. This is your last chance of the year to either do a rant or a raid. So has anyone got anything they want to throw into the hopper? And Greg, you've got your hand up, so go ahead. This isn't uh, a rant or a rave. It's a question and at the risk of sounding totally stupid. Um, why aren't rear view mirrors motorized in any way? I mean, you have motors in the side view mirrors, you have 
uh, motors in like an F-150 to put the shifter down to put it into laptop productivity mode. I mean, there's motors in literally everything uh, except for the rear view mirror. And I realize you don't move it a lot, but I would say, I would argue that you don't move your side mirrors that often. I know you can't reach to the far side of the car, but I just, I don't know, just a question that kind of struck me. Why can't I control my rear view mirror with a button? So you I, somehow find it difficult to reach up three feet? Well, not difficult, but I mean, let's be honest, I'm kind of lazy, so I don't really want to reach. And I sit, I sit far back, so I don't really want to reach up and move. That's a yeah. good question. I, I mean, I think for like the side mirrors, definitely motorized. I, I get with what you're saying. Um, for that that rear view mirror, I don't know so much about a motor to adjust it, but what I think of is like how you can have memory seats with different profiles. So like if I get in my car, you know, it's adjusted for me. And then if my girlfriend gets in my car, it's adjusted to her. So if there was a motor in the rear view mirror to adjust that then to her liking and it's just one of the profiles that's where i think it like a motor up there would be um most beneficial and i mean i'm with you i'm lazy too so that it would be cool but um yeah i definitely think there's i don't know there's something there there's something there that's a very very good uh, illustration of where it would be an advantage anyone else or anyone else got a rant and rave i mean i mean i think i know the reason of why why they don't have them is like cost cutting I, that yeah. has to be it because they're usually so chintzy those rear view mirrors like you know the rear view mirror and yeah, then like the visor they're usually cost like cost cutting so isn't an parts. issue in an s in an s500 i mean look at that True. thing the, the one we just drove why wouldn't that you, know, you don't even see it in bentley's i'm i'm not a huge yeah. fan of the video rear view center mirrors so i'd rather actually see the motorized the money spent to motorize them than put another screen up there which I still haven't found one that doesn't give my eyes some kind of fatigue. Mr. Robinson, you've been pretty quiet in this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think maybe the only reason they haven't done it is because someone hasn't thought of it. Uh, I give Greg credit uh, for that. Uh, Mercedes-Benz could certainly take that electric motor that adjusts the brake pedal and put it up there. <laughs> um, and it would be a more practical thing, I think um i don't know the last thing i want in a car is one more electric motor that's going to break so <laughs> uh, i don't know uh, is but it if, a, can't be a safety thing yeah well Could that's be. that's what i was wondering is it might there might be a reason because like we said they put motors in everything so why wouldn't they at least try to put it there and that's what makes me think there is a reason that i'm missing and i thought maybe I somebody here would know it when you, you look know? at those, when you look at some of the cars and all the stuff they have at the top of the windshield, you know, these big boxes with cameras in them and everything else, what would be one little more bulge in that? I or, mean, or, I guess I could see it being maybe a, a safety thing because there are lo like laws that you have to have. Like if there's any law that's standard across the country about some sort of mirror on your car, it's the rear view mirror because so many different states have different laws when it comes to your side view mirrors. Like that's, you know, not a standard across the country, but like, I'm pretty sure the rear view mirror is standard everywhere. So if there is a federal uh, yeah. dictate on, I don't know whether it's how big it has to be or how much it has to be able to see, but there are federal uh, NHTSA guidelines on mm -hmm. uh, mirrors and visibility. So, all right, well, that was an, that was a, we went off, uh, went on to a track I didn't expect. Anybody else got a rant and rave? Um, oh, Sorry. wait, I have, I have one, I have one rant. Sorry, Sorry, just really quickly. Um, <laughs> I think there's sometimes a disconnect between what people think you can buy or what automakers have available to what people think you can buy. For example, I would say like a two-door pickup truck like people like, oh, you can't find a two-door F-150 anywhere. Well, that's true. Like a dealer's not going to stock a two-door F-150 because mostly it's used for mostly commercial purposes. But if you wanted a two-door F-150, you can go buy one. You can buy a standard cab. You just have to get it built. So that is my, that's my rant. Like if you want a bench seat in a Tahoe, go, you can go order one. Feel free. You can't get one in a high country because, mm, uh, 
they just don't do that anymore. But I think you could get one in an LT or an LS. Um, so yeah, there are things that are available that dealers just don't stock, but that doesn't mean the automaker does not have them for you to purchase. And it's never been easier than now since dealers don't actually have vehicles on their lots. They're all basically mm -hmm. uh, built to order. So you can pretty much get whatever you want in a vehicle uh, now if you're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. then la the last part, if you're willing to pay for it. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you one and all. I want to also thank uh, back at home base, our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood. Uh, Greg, thanks for producing our terrific podcast and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. And thanks everybody here and thank everybody out there for being uh, joining us. And by the way, if you're new to the Motor Week uh, situation and you'd like to know where you can watch the weekly uh, television series that we all work so hard on, uh, cruise on over to motorweek.org, pull down the tab about the show up in the right hand corner, put in your zip code and you can get uh, the stations that we're on in your local area. Also our cable partner, Mav TV. You can go to mavtv.com to find out where it's available in your area and what time we're on. If you're streaming, you've got lots of choices. If you just wanna see our latest road tests, hit on over to youtube.com slash motorweek. All of our segments are there. Uh, our latest shows are available to stream free at pbs pbs.org slash motorweek that's pbs.org slash motorweek and we're also on pbs living part of the prime channels so basically if you've got a screen you can find motorweek thanks for listening to our podcast and until next time thank you also happy new year everyone and thanks for being a part of motorweek You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Lucas Oil and TireRack.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.